Hello everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to our June webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. We've got a lot of attendees today, which is fab, um, especially considering the great weather we're having at the moment. So thanks so much for joining us. Um, today our webinar is presented by Zoe Turner and she's going to be talking to us about Git and GitHub. Um, so I know it's very popular. So thank you, Zoe. Um, before we start, just wanted to share a um, couple of messages with everyone. Um, so the webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to access both that and any materials that Zoe shares, um, both on our website and usually on YouTube as well. Uh, we should run until about 2 p.m. And if you have any questions throughout, you can just use the um, Q&A facility, which should be in your top bar there. Um, and Zoe will let us know whether she's happy to answer throughout or if we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. Um, if you don't already know, we run webinars every month at this time. And um, if you're interested in running one, you can email us for a bit more information. Um, and you can also sign up to next month's webinar on our website. We also have the NHSR community Slack channel. Um, so if you have any questions you think of afterwards, feel free to post them on there. It's very active. And um, we usually also have a um, little feedback questionnaire um, that my colleague Jane will be sharing in the chat box. So um, if you're happy to, it'd be great to get uh, any feedback. Um, so without any further delay, I'll hand over to Zoe. Thank you very much. Hopefully everybody can hear me because I've got this thing on. Um, I'm Zoe Turner, I've been introduced, but I work for Nottinghamshire Healthcare Trust, which is a mental health and general health trust that covers services in Nottinghamshire, Nottingham. We also have services like Ranton Hospital, the secure hospital, and it's a range of services. And I'm a senior information analyst. I work with um, a particular data science team called the CDU, which is the Clinical Development Unit data science team. So I wanted to talk about mainly GitHub, but Git is related to it today because I started thinking about Git and or hearing Git and GitHub about 2018. I set up an account and I didn't use it until 2019, but there's this long period where I could have used it. And that's what I wanted to introduce to people today because I know it's quite new for a lot of people. Um, there's a lot of functionality with GitHub. I'm not Going to, I'll go to the next slide because there was a little bit of a, a thing there. I was on the wrong slide when it first started. I think it's rather than say what I will cover, it's more like what I will not cover. I'm not going to talk about how to set up an account. It's actually quite easy, but I didn't really want to cover that in this session. You can stay without an account if you have one. That's great. This will still be very useful to you. I'm not actually going to talk that much about version control either, which is pretty impressive, I think, given that Git is basically version control and GitHub is a, a method of using Git. But I'm not going to do that. And it's not going to be that technical. There will be some technical terminology in there, but I'm not going to be talking about command line or any of that stuff. I mean, that will be the last time I mention it. This I tried to think of how I would explain this to a family relative who had a slight bit of interest in it because I know lots of my family are not that interested in it, but without going into too much detail. So I quite like this GIF. I'll let it run through a couple of times. This is what happened sort of to me when I asked for particular Git access from IT. Git is if you're an international person to the UK, it is actually quite a sort of like naughty word to use. So I found that quite difficult when I talked to my IT department when I was asking for Git access because they thought I was being rude. You might hear quite frequently now the code is on my GitHub repo. And if you're not hearing it, I'm really hoping that you will start hearing it a lot more and I will explain what these things are. So who uses this or who, sh who should use it? I can't even read my own slides. Analysts should use it and can use it. Data scientists too, academics, but also I'll just flip over to teams like my own team, which is the CDU data science team. We use it quite a lot. We try to share a lot of our stuff and also the lovely NHSR community who got me started on all of this stuff with R and GitHub and Git and are hosting this webinar today. So I'm very grateful for that. So they have their own area and I've managed to contribute to a few things through there. So you'll see my name on their repo. What doesn't go on? Again, I could go on to what goes on to Git, but I'm gonna do the what doesn't. 
So these are like the standard things. And I found this on other people's work, like large files, because it takes up a lot of space. But that's not to say you can't, because there are some large files on there. Passwords, not a good idea as well. Outputs sometimes, but again, sometimes you do share things like CSV and R data files, if you're familiar with R. And anything patient identifiable, it is not a secure area at all. It's in the cloud. You can have private repositories, but we never put anything patient identifiable or person identifiable if you're working with other data like staff information. I just wanted to show you what a new account will look like because to sort of have an understanding of what is available or what it looks like, because it's very easy to forget what it looks like. I set up my own account like a, a I've actually misspelt my own name a few times. So I have this as my Twitter handle. So this is my test account. So I've just created something and it's very sparse. This is what a new account would look like if you were to, to look for somebody else's, which I'll show you how to do or set up your own. And this is my own that's more active and I've done a lot of stuff with it. As you can see, I've fiddled with it and put pictures on and links and all sorts of things. So it can go from very, very basic. Oops, I've just opened it again to let's make sure I don't do that again to lots of information. But if you're like me, the first thing you're going to want to do is not to start your account. You're going to look for something on Git. And searching GitHub is actually something that took me a while to get my head around. Strangely, it's not that difficult, but I really struggled with it. I think I was expecting it to be like Google or maybe even SharePoint. There are two ways really to search for things. This is a picture of my Teams GitHub and you can search for a repository name. So if you hear something particularly from our team about patient feedback, you can start typing patient in there and see if you get anything with that name for a repository. But you might want to look more globally across GitHub and this is where I sort of got stuck because in the top, it's, it's, it's only me really, but in the top bar, you can type into the search or jump to. And if you did something like NHS number, you get two options and that's what threw me. I never really paid attention to the fact that you can look for NHS number in the organization or the user account or the whole of GitHub. And often it defaults to the place where you're already in. So all GitHub is a better way of looking um, if you're looking for something outside of the repository area that you're in. And this is what you'll get. And just to kind of go through it a little bit, because it's kind of interesting. NHS number certainly for me has lots of work or people have done lots of work with it. So you can see down um, at the bottom left hand corner the different languages. Now GitHub, you don't need to tell it the language you've used. It knows what languages your code is and it just does that automatically and it does these little blobs in the middle of these repository kind of uh, bookmarks, not bookmarks, it's more like a preview. And so you can look for things that you recognize in languages and I don't actually recognize much of that. I know what a Jupyter notebook is in Python, but I've never used it. Interestingly, I've not found much SQL, particularly in relation to NHS number. And I think that's um, a bit of a shame really, because I know a lot of us analysts do use SQL and have used it in conjunction with NHS numbers. The repositories are the kind of areas of code area. The code itself, it's been no named lots and lots of times, thousands of times. And the other area to look for users, so that would probably be looking for a user name or company name or organization name with NHS number in it. Like all searches, you have to be careful of spaces and the characters that you use. So on that previous view, I looked for NHS space number and I got two repositories specifically for R. But if I look for NHS no space number, you get three different and they're perhaps more useful repositories. So these are specifically R related. There is actually this one that's from Mark, which is um, NHS number. He's put his onto CRAN. So that is a duplicate repository, but you can get to the original by selecting cell or m uh, I'm just trying to think slash NHS number. And there's another one under from, I think it's Sam Ellis. I've looked at that one as well, which is the NHS number generator. For those who are not familiar with this, I've written a blog, I think it was for NHSR community. The NHS number is a generated number and the algorithm is available through Wikipedia. So these are generating NHS numbers. I'll take it from the very beginning. So just to go through how to search for something, we're going to start with trying to find my own account. 
I'm going to play this on YouTube and I hope it will go big and that you will see it still. It looks like you can still see it. In the top right hand corner, I'm typing in my username, let's you go 007. Then I'm finding myself in the user list and then selecting my link that gets me to my account. It's very simple. That's the first slide, the first sorry web page that you'll get if you just look for Git. GitHub, sorry, and you don't have an account. When you're on the account or the user area to filter by repositories, and this is certainly very important because I have something like 35 repositories, it says there. If you're just looking for the ones that I've created, and I only realized this because I was playing around with GitHub just for this presentation, actually. So you learn a lot by doing webinars. So there's a plug for doing a webinar. You by default get everything back and I'll explain all the missing 25 in a moment. But if you look at sources, those are 10 results that are my own results. So you can filter down within the search area what it is I've created or perhaps contributed to. So the other terminology to explain what those other 25 repositories are is that I've forked a lot of other people's repositories. And so what happens with a fork is I've copied the repository and it now appears on my own GitHub and I can make changes to those repositories and I can then send those back to the original, but I request those to be sent back. It means that other people can see what I've been working on, what I found of interest, what I'm doing, which is quite useful. NHSR underscore blogs is on there, which I've contributed to the blogs. So um, you could see some conversation that I've had with that particular repository. But the one underneath, and I do highly recommend that this one, which is the Jaringham Basics and Beyond slides from Sylvia Canalon. It's what this presentation is built upon, and it's also something that she spoke about at the NHSR conference last year. Um, I haven't contributed to her repository, but what I did was I took a copy of it so that I could see where she put things and run it on my own computer. So you can see that I have a lot of interest in that. I have an interest in 25 other repositories as well. The other word you'll hear a lot is clones and it can I'm still not familiar with a fork or a clone, but essentially a clone and a fork go together. But you can also do a clone, which means I've taken a copy of it, but it's not on my GitHub. It's actually on my computer. And so the picture on this slide is showing what happens if I try to commit. That's another word which I haven't explained, but don't worry about it. I'm making changes to these these webs, uh, these repository codes, and I wanted to see if I could send it back to the original and thankfully I can't. So this is for Chris Beely's shiny beginner Git training, uh, not Git training, it's shiny beginners training that he's got on his GitHub repository. I've copied it, I created something new on it, tried to send it back and it said, nope, you don't have permissions. So if you just take a clone, you can make changes to it, but you can't keep those changes and you can't send them back to the original repository. So if you're going to take somebody else's repository to work upon, you need a fork and you don't have to send your changes back. You can just take it and then work off on your own. So some other areas to sort of move away, because that's probably about the most technical I think I'll get. But the importance of having a readme file, it's something that you'll find um, or you should find in lots of software programming and um, perhaps even in folders. I used to do this a lot. I'd leave a little readme notepad. And the point of that is to be a greeting to individuals, to people looking at it, to give an idea of what's in the repository. It's like the cover of a book. What's in there? Why is this here? What was I even thinking? And so this example slide is another one of our repositories on the Teams GitHub repository sites area, which tells you how to install it on your own computer. So you've got the installation instructions and some examples of how to use it. And that's what a good readme will have. There are some repositories that don't have any readmes at all, though. You have to add it in. But the repository, the, so the readme might even be the book in itself. And when I was looking for this, I found a readme of readmes. So if you want to have an idea of what's a beautiful readme, what kind of information you can have on them, this is a, a link and these slides are all interactive. So you can go to the actual um, link and see the information. So there's a lot of examples there, which is a lot to go through and it's very interesting. The other nice part of GitHub is you might not want a full repository, which is essentially like a project You're working on some things. You might just want to share just a little bit of code either for yourself or for other people. 
And you can look for these things called gists and they're kind of kept separately from the GitHub area. When I was looking for this, I realized it doesn't actually appear as a link on my own repository site. So if I just play this, try and make it big. This is me going onto Google, looking for gist GitHub. Actually found it. It's something that people do look for quite frequently. Discover gists. If you go to the search engine, which is very similar to um, the normal Git area, I'm looking for my user. And the way I'm looking for that is writing user semicolon and then my username because I know that. And I, you can see all of the things that I've done. The next search I'm looking for is for language semicolon R. And then I looked for NHS afterwards. I'm rapidly running through this because it goes a bit fast, but the repository that you get to is actually Tom Jemmett's repository because he created a gist that he shared with us on NHS Slack, how to create NHS trust using a GeoJSON file. So he put all the code on there and he shared it with me and I just found it really heartening to find his, um, his gist by looking for the search for this particular webinar. License to copy. One of the very interesting things about sharing your code is that it's good practice to look for the license that people should be putting on. They, they have to put this on themselves though, what they want to share their code under. There are two licenses that we use particularly within my team and what I use myself, that's the MIT license. So I use those for Shiny applications, which is this is from my own repository list and I use Creative Commons, which uh, is usually for things like blogs, words. Um, this, actually, the UK working days is a combination of code and uh, words. So, so long as it has a license to be used, then that means it's freely available. Well, depending on what the license is, but if you look for those, so you see that in that kind of um, preview box that you, you get all the information of the repositories. It tells you what the language is, what license is on there and when it was last updated. And that in itself might be also interesting to you because you might want to see how active is this repository? Are you doing a lot of work on it or is it a bit uh, old? Um, you can archive repositories. These are not archived, but as you can see, they're, a, they're not that old actually. I last worked on them in 2020. In the repository itself, you can also see in a couple of places what the license is and you can get more information on what that license means as well. So it has a, a particular license. What I'm thinking, uh, not folder. Um, it's a text file that appears as a license and also on the right hand side, which I'll also explain a bit more about. You have a license there and on this occasion it's the MIT, so it's clearly labeled. Also in that top right hand side of the Git repository, there's an area about and again, you can add this information or you can see that people have added information about what the repository is about and it's a, a lot shorter in character space. So it's a bit punchier than a readme file and a link if there are any links. So this is um, our CDU data science teams experience dashboard and the link you can see there is to the dashboard itself, the shiny app which is published. I can see some questions are probably flashing up. So at the next one, I'll just have a quick look at some questions, see if there's anything to run through. Oh, I do apologize. Somebody says it seems confusing that people are already using Git and some hints and tips. I do apologize. I was trying to make this as simple as possible. And if I haven't really done that, I do apologize. It's very difficult. A lot of the things I was looking at before I got to this stage, it was about version control and there was technical language. So this is the first attempt of hopefully many where people try and simplify even what Git is, GitHub. And will the introduction to GitHub for anyone who doesn't know what GitHub is and heard of doesn't know where to start? I think that's the repeat to the other one. So yes, if you haven't heard of GitHub, um, this is very difficult. It's something where people share their code. I'm hoping that people have heard my code is on a, a GitHub repo. If you haven't, that's something that I'm hoping that will come into our language of everyday language within analysts. I am a, an analyst who used to use SQL and I'm not seeing a lot of SQL written or shared through GitHub or other methods. Um, I am seeing a lot of R and the R stats community do do a lot of this. And it's I guess I was going at it at the point where people hear this and then want to know how to use GitHub. So I do apologize. I haven't really quite made it basic enough. If I continue then, the chapters of change, if somebody has done some code in a GitHub repository and then they've worked on that 
side from the main branch. They used to be called master. It's the old name and it's the default code area. The old name moved away because of um, historical connotations that were not particularly friendly to how we think today. We now rename the branches where we can to main. But if people are working on something that's aside from the main, so they may take a copy of their own copy, they're doing work on their own chapter, we call those branches. And so you can see that on GitHub's page under this um, icon called branches, which is next to the uh, drop down menu. The branches are closely linked to issues and I'll explain more about issues as well because this is where you can highlight where you've got some things that you're wanting to work on or issues that other people have raised. If you've written something or like on this presentation, if somebody were to say you've missed out this particular crucial part of your um, presentation slide, you can then put an issue onto the repository. So I'm working out in the open. And lots of people are doing this where you can add your own issues and then correspond on there. So we've added our own issues in this area. Is that? I just had it. I'm hopefully still being recorded. The issues are often linked to the branch names and in our convention within our team, we use the issue number attached to the branch name. So the issues number 12 about distilled templates became a branch so that then I can link those two together. So that's why you might see numbers in front of words on the branch because it's linking back to the issue. When you accept the branches or you merge them in, these are all terminology that I guess is a bit technical, so I do apologize. Um, they do, you can link your issues to your, your branches, but it's just to give you this idea that there's a lot of correspondence that goes on on GitHub that's not necessarily on people's computers, but it's all open for you to view, like going to the library and understanding the Dewey system to find books and to understand how things are catalogued. I would say that the issues are also a form of chatting. It's very open source. I raised an issue, uh, it says back in 2020. It wasn't really an issue, it was more of a, a question over the code lists that were being used by Open Safely around ethnicity categories. I wanted to understand how they were grouping certain groups together. And I got a great response back from Rahini, giving me a lot more information and where they'd got that information from. And that's now in the issue that's open still there. It's the issue itself is closed, but the conversation is open for everybody and can be reinstated as well. The process of thinking about Git and GitHub is that nothing is deleted. Nothing is rewritten, overwritten permanently. There's always a trail. And that's also the same with conversations and words or how people have made mistakes. So if you look through people's change history called commits, you can see mistakes and people correcting them. Other conversations that I found when I had a problem with SQL um, importing into R, I, instead of going to Stack Overflow, I was pointed towards this particular GitHub issue, which gave, an ex gave information why that was a bug and why it was going to continue to be a bug and then how to solve that. So again, the issue has kind of transcended from being a specific Git, GitHub package issue to this is actually a helpful piece of advice. It became like a Stack Overflow problem solving thing. Now, maybe I should have started with this, but if you're being directed to GitHub to download some files, this is a particularly important slide. There are three different ways to get those files to download, and we do this for the introduction to R and R Studio training as well. So if I just make that bigger, what I'm first of all doing, if I can get rid of YouTube's uh, flashing bits, is looking for the repository, which is in the bottom left area where it says find a repository, which was referenced in one of the earlier slides. And in there I'm typing ONS. It's actually a very sensitive typing system, so you don't have to press return to get that. You just need to type ONS. I don't need to type it all out. It found the first one and the repository that comes up is the ONS data, data tidy repository, which I have on the Teams GitHub. When you click on that, this is what it looks like. And to download all the files, and when I say all the files, that includes the license agreement and the readme.mn, MD 
the data and the R code, there's a green button on this first re repo page which has code written on it. If you click on that, it gives you a couple of things that are related to copying and cloning and forking and all of that lot. But what you want at the bottom is download zip. So you just get all of those files within a zip file. And that will download to your downloads folder, I think if that's set on your computer. The other way you can get data if it is shared on the GitHub is to download it specifically. And on my particular repository, I have a folder that I've created and called data. If you go to that folder, if you're downloading a file like an RDA file, which is a specific R data file or a zip file, if you click on those particular links, it will give you a, a grey download button, which is towards the right side of the repository. And you can download it just a single file. What's interesting, though, when I was doing this and I hadn't quite realised, is if you're looking at a CSV file, which I've also got loaded, it takes a little while to load because what it does, it, rather than just say this is a download file, it gives you the information that's in it. There is no download button for that, but what you can do is click on the raw button, which is on the right side, which is where you'd expect that download to get the text, and then you'd have to manually copy and paste that text. But by doing that, you don't have everything that surrounds the GitHub area. So you're not copying all the kind of GitHub web based paraphernalia that's on there. Just to give some context to the ONS mortality data, this data is actually available in the NHSR data sets package, which is on CRAN. It's the provisional registered deaths that are from, I think, 2005 to 2019. Uh, so they're all fixed data sets. So you can use that if you just go and download the package. But what I use it for is to add to it, and I certainly did that through the 2020 period with um, deaths provisionally registered and 2021. So when I put it onto my truck, my my team's repo, it's actually updated as best I can. The other great thing about GitHub and where you might sort of see some overlap to uh, some things that you may not realize are actually through GitHub is that GitHub now allows web page publishing and it's free. So if you this is more about this bigger how to find uh, the blog information, so presentations. Sorry, I'm looking for the presentations repository, which is also where I've saved this particular. You don't see it in this list on this YouTube video, but you will do today. If you click on the link that I've set, you if you have a GitHub repository, and so this is talking about other people, if they've had that, if they've set the settings to publish the pages, this is what the readme file will start looking like. I've shared that you are, uh, HTML URL so that people can see the example, but it just really publishes the readme file. If we go back, I'll show you the readme file. They look the same. So that's what you're getting from that particular link. And if you go into one of these um, folders, you often see something like roadmap.html. The problem with clicking on that is you don't get anything that you can actually view. And if you click on the view raw data, you get raw HTML, which is very difficult to navigate. And it's not the pictures, it's not like this presentation. So that's not really very useful as a user. But the little trick that you can do if it is already published is copy the you, the path link in a sense. So the presentations is the main area and that's been published through GitHub. If you then copy the folder and then the name of the HTML file. I'm just doing that in this video and then I'm moving up to the URL area and putting it at the very end of the URL. And then press return, it then appears. And this is what it looks like published. So you can see the HTML. Now, people might share those URLs individually or they might just just share one page. It's just to give you an idea of what you can do with the web pages. You can also publish 
blogs through GitHub, which is nice as well in that it's free. You can use Distill, which is a package in R. Um, it's quite easy to use to a certain degree. I think some of the problems with Git and GitHub is getting it set up on your computer so that it can talk to the web. But once that's all set up and there are people I'm sure within NHSR community who will help you. If you're publishing a blog through GitHub, you can see I'm just trying to highlight with this particular picture the there's a picture of the blog that we do through my team, but the URL itself you can see in the name it says github.io. So that to me um, sort of triggers this. It's on GitHub. I can find the code somewhere and I can look at what they've actually done. So for example, if there's a nice picture or nice text, I can go to the GitHub, find the repo which is called team hyphen blog, which is the next part of that URL and then look through the code to see where that nice text is coming from. OK, and so I'd like to stop there. Um, that's it for today. I tried to do a quick run through just to sort of show people. And again, I'd like to apologize that maybe this was still a little bit too high level. And a bit fast. So are there any questions specifically on that? I'm just going to look at the Q and A's as I speak. And I'm seeing published. So. Uh, Zoe, a big yep. thank you for thank you. for doing the webinar and and just to uh, kind of uh, kind of underscore the point really that we are a a grassroots community where it is really the the joy of learning and pleasure that that drives people's contributions really so so um, we recognise Git is a complex topic and actually it's 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 new for Zoe uh, and I'm uh, not just an imposter I'm I'm an uh, you know, an imposter's imposter when it comes to GitHub and Git. So um, we're, we're very keen to learn uh, what people's thoughts are and also, uh, you know, try and find a way to support with more training on this area. But um, but just Zoe, you personally, will you just tell us a little bit more now about kind of I d how 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 much now Git GitHub is part of your 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 working life now? From, from a time before when it was yeah. not at all part of it, was it? Well, that's why I feel really uh, awkward at not making it basic enough because I feel that so much because talk to me in 2018, I was like that, like I just don't know where to start with this. And yet in a very short period of time, GitHub and Git is what I work on. I want all of my code to be on GitHub or Git because I use it internally. So Git is the language that's used and GitHub is like the overlay, like R is the language underneath R Studio. I use it all the time. I'm using it to go onto other people's repositories to see what they're doing, copying their great work, giving them credit for it because there's a lot of great work. Out. I just I, I would be at a loss without it. I don't want to change my laptop because it took a long time to get my working laptop to, you know, to get that link to GitHub. And now it's there. I don't ever want to lose it. Well, that passion comes across really, and that's Hopefully. I think, uh, and and that itself is going to be uh, infectious. Although the R number is not over one yet, I'm, I'm sure it will get there for <laughs> for infection. So great. Um, thank you. I'll 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 just see if there's other people who want to ask questions or make comments. Thank you. I'm just looking through some of the comments as well. So how do I upload code to Git? How do I use it to track changes I make to code? That is a fabulous question. I think that would probably be the next stage. I think you can upload your code to GitHub without having that link specifically to between your computer and GitHub. You can create an account and post things on there. It just makes it a bit difficult to keep that version control, which is what you're looking for for the track changes. And just to add to the track changes thing, one of the best things about it is when you track things that you've deleted. So if you have, if you're familiar with SQL code and commenting out stuff, sometimes you can have like reams and reams and reams of green text, you know, commented out code because getting rid of stuff is terrifying. But when you delete something from your code and you version control it, I did mention version control, but in the, the questions, I didn't mean to do that, but it means that you can say why you deleted something. So you're giving sort of like a thought process to your coding structure, so not just in your building, but also in your refining. So yes, that would probably be the next thing I think we would look at is how to get onto GitHub, how to set up your account, how to then track changes and how to do all of that bit. I think that's the, the real big steep learning curve for me and I'm still in it. 
I'm still halfway up the steep learning curve there. So how do I tell our studio to play nicely with Git? Well, yes, that's the that's that learning curve where I'm a bit stalled. There are two ways that people do their join between the computer and it's in this regard it's GitHub using Git, either with HTTPS or SSH keys. And I must admit, I really struggled with that and I needed help with that. So the NHSR community, there are a few great people there who can set your computer off and get that help, you know, get that started. So it's really it's more engineering. We're talking about technical stuff. On the on the uh, on the community Slack channel, uh, th there is a GitHub channel, uh, and uh, I would suggest that if people uh, can can uh, access that and post their technical questions there, uh, I think you will find, as those indicated, that um, it's a very friendly space to ask questions, really, and it's very welcoming. So, so please do do go on that. And uh, in the meantime, I have contacted uh, our studio to see if they will do a webinar on how our studio will uh, connect to to GitHub and Git and so on. So um, all of the things you're asking are, are really helpful to us, by the way, but but um, try try the GitHub channel as well, please on Slack. That would be fabulous. I'd certainly be signing up to that one. Um, somebody's asked about the NHS data sets containing all UK data. Is it just England? It is just England that I know of. These are kind of like training data sets to be used in training, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't get other four nations data in there it's just helping to get that in so uh, that's when my first introduction to github was contributing to the nhsr data sets i had the data and i wanted to add it to it um, and i had tom Gemmett and chris maney who particularly helped me get that on there and that really helped actually contributing to something that was already established and they talked me through it and i i to this day did things and I don't even know whether I did it right or wrong. It didn't really matter. It was having a go, making mistakes and having a supportive community there who probably mopped up after me quietly and made sure that everything was working. And that's on CRAN. So I have contributed to a CRAN package because of that help. So if you have data sets that you want in there, that will be wonderful if you could contact us and, and get that shared. And, and the NHSR footprint is for the entire NHS, so it covers the whole of the UK. Um, and uh, we're very keen for having, all, uh, I mean, you know, the NHS is, is, is full of data sets, uh, but there are many that are relatively local, some are national, some are completely open and so on. Um, but uh, we had a blog post from someone who uh, showed how you can create a synthetic data set, for example. So, so um, many ways really to try and feed into the NHS data sets package. Yes, it's primarily used for training because we were fed up of using uh, training examples that were based on uh, the diesel cars data, for example. Uh, it just got a little bit uh, uh, kind of monotonous, but but so, so pr it allows training to happen more flexibly. But also, I think uh, it allows people who have developed packages to have dummy data sets uh, on which they can uh, demonstrate the use of their packages. So um, yes, feel free to contribute. And uh, th there's many ways you can talk to us on Slack or get, get in touch by, by email or just tweet to us, uh, whichever way suits really. Uh, Lynn's also had a really great question. The impression that she was getting is that you get to grips with it by using it. And yes, I think that's that's the difficulty of it. It's it's more complicated to try and explain what you're doing because I don't have the language for it. I find that when I'm teaching R, introduction to R, I, I hit that stumbling block when I talk about R Markdown and those people who are in the audience who are familiar with R Markdown and R will perhaps understand, will get that sense of it's very difficult to explain what you're doing because it's not what you were doing with your R script. So the, the Git and the GitHub and the version control is just not language that as an analyst I've ever used. and Yes, it does get easier. Uh, I'm not sure about any open courses. I'm sure they are. When I looked to try and help me work out what to do with this, there was no beginner's beginner, like before you even get an account. And it's very difficult. So I couldn't copy anyone. <laughs> and I'm a big copier and I give a lot of credit to people. And I love the R community because people like to share. But it's always got this assumption of you understand even what version control is. You even know what you're doing with that. And this is terminology I never used. I didn't do version control in my SQL code. It just it's not there. But 
now I'm going into that world, I can see the benefits of it. I can, it's also, I won't deny it. It's quite difficult. Um, so just, yeah, keep plugging at it. Get involved with some existing projects. Have a look at people's repositories. Write an issue. Just have a little thing like I've, I've commented on somebody's data and I wanted to copy it and I said, um, you don't have a license on there. Can I help you set up your license? And so now we have a correspondence about things and that's really great. Uh, and that was really useful. There is so much in it. It's a bit like, oh, you could do quite a lot of stuff with um, Git and they keep GitHub. They keep updating it, keep changing it like our studio. They keep improving things. So do people is another question sometimes create local repositories on their laptops? Yes, they do. My colleague did that. Um, and unfortunately, and just be aware of that, that it's not backed up if it's on your laptop unless you have some sort of system to back up things and she lost her code. So although the version control was there, it's a work laptop and we had an update and for some individuals, but not for everybody, it just re-imaged everything and wiped it all clear. So she lost all of that. So you do have to, it's really useful, but just think of your backup situation and cloud-based, you have to be very careful in that it's cloud and so we have to be mindful of patient identifiability and issues with patient sharing and things like that data. And somebody's asked about a quick introduction on branches in the main branch. I hope I kind of covered that really, really briefly just to explain what it was. We might be able to do something more about that, um, but the slides some people have also asked, they are freely available on my team's website and also I'll put them on my blog and I'm sure I can blog for it for NHSR community and share that too. Are there any other questions? As you can tell, this is quite tricky doing something that's outside of the whole art. Oh, you think you've kind of got one thing and then something else comes along and you're like, well, actually that's, it's it's, it's not R, is GitHub basically. I think, that, I think though the, um, the, the basic point though, I think modern data science is is a is a really complex uh, endeavor now uh, and it's a synthesis of a number of disciplines each of them have their own kind of history and depth and expertise and qualifications but you know the modern di data scientist needs to be familiar with software engineering which is kind of the, the sort of stuff we're talking about here needs to understand statistics and data analysis, need to understand multiple programming languages, data visualization, automation. There's so many things that the modern data scientist needs that um, it would be unreasonable really for, for the NHSR community to just stick to things that are that are, are related because the ecosystem that supports it is also very, very important. Uh, in fact, our studio um, will also support Python in, in the R Studio environment, yet you know the, the branding is is based on R. But um, um, yeah, so so uh, I, I, I think we want to foster an environment where people have the joy of learning and can share with each other and 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 recognize that there are no uh, kind of um, there's no requirement to be a, a seventh Dan black belt expert or something before you can, you can kind of come and come and enjoy uh, enjoy the process with others really. Um, that I, I'm still seeing some technical questions. So I think again, I just refer you back probably to the Slack channel in the first instance uh, as being the, the kind of place to go. I just wanted to answer one last question because I think it's really good about how do you deal with sensitive information in your code? For example, server details of your organization, etc. I do do something cunning with that where I kind of have another SQL script that I, ref not SQL script, R script that I refer to, but that I don't send to the repo. I, d I just there's something called a git ignore where you can say specifically ignore that file and so I get around using sensitive server details but there are other things that I think our studio could certainly help us with it, uh, or I think it's an R thing where you can have your passwords saved somewhere else in your computer and refer to it I'm not using the right terminology because this is proper software engineering but there are ways around it so yes be very mindful of your server details and also be very mindful of any code even if you're not sharing this of putting things like patient information in there so when you're looking for individuals we really be, must be careful because that's one of the big areas I would say like an excel document and hiding your data it's very easy to get into that habit so then when you do share that you can inadvertently send out patient information. So have good practices from the start. 
And there's only one, one other question, how do I join people's projects? That's an interesting question because I know with NHSR community, you can talk to individuals and get involved that way. Um, I think if you're going to try and get involved with projects elsewhere, it's just that conversation. You're starting it with issues, maybe taking a copy of the repo if you're in, if you know what you're doing and then send it back with these changes and have that conversation with individuals or contact them directly. And I think that's the end of that for the questions. Thank you for everyone's time. Thank you as well, Zoe. Always much appreciated and look forward to, to future webinars and future progress on, on Git and GitHub as well. Thanks very much. Should I hand back to anybody now? Or? Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, thank you again, Zoe. We had really high attendance today, so obviously appreciated by many attendees. Thank you. Thanks very much. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.